this newscast, the podcast designed to help you fall asleep. If you enjoy our show, please write us a review on the podcast app. Also, share us with a friend. Find us on snoozecast.com and follow us on social media and wherever you listen to podcasts. We'd like to thank our listeners. While you get tucked into bed, know that every night, thousands of snoozecast listeners are tucking in as well, including in Sweden, Sri Lanka, and Slovenia. May you all have pleasant dreams. This episode is brought to you by our Patreon supporters and by Snowmelt. Tonight, by listener request, we'll be reading the next section of the classic children's story Heidi, published in 1881 by Swiss author Johanna Spiri. It's a novel about the life of a young girl in her grandfather's care in the Swiss Alps. Heidi is one of the best-selling books ever written and is among the best-known works of Swiss literature. We'll pick up where we left off at the start of Chapter 5. In the last episode, it's the middle of the winter on the mountain. Peter gives Grandfather and Heidi the idea that she should visit his grandmother. Grandmother is grateful for the company, and Heidi inspires her grandfather to help repair the grandmother's cottage. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Two visitors. Two winters had nearly passed. Heidi was happy, for the spring was coming again, with a soft, delicious wind that made the fir trees roar. Soon, she'd be able to go up the pasture, where blue and yellow flowers greeted her at every step. She was nearly eight years old and had learned to take care of the goats, who ran after her like little dogs. Several times, the village teacher had sent word by Peter that the child was wanted in school, but the old man had not paid any attention to the message, and had kept her with him as before. It was a beautiful morning in March, The snow had melted on the slopes and was going fast. Snowdrops were peeping through the ground, which seemed to be getting ready for spring. Heidi was running to and fro before the door when she suddenly saw an old gentleman dressed in black standing beside her. As she appeared frightened, he said kindly, You must not be afraid of me, for I love children. Give me your hand, Heidi, and tell me where your grandfather is. He's inside, making round wooden spoons, the child replied, opening the door while she spoke. It was the old pastor of the village, who had known the grandfather years ago. After entering, he approached the old man, saying, Good morning, neighbor. The old man got up, surprised, and offering a seat to the visitor, said, Good morning, Mr. Parson. Here is a wooden chair, if it is good enough. Sitting down, the parson said, It's a long time since I've seen you, neighbor. I've come today to talk over a matter with you. I'm sure you can guess what it's about. The clergyman here looked at Heidi, 
who was standing near the door. Heidi, run out to see the goats, said the grandfather, and bring them some salt. You can stay till I come. Heidi disappeared on the spot. The child should have come to school a year ago, the parson went on to say. Didn't you get the teacher's warning? What do you intend to do with the child? I do not want her to go to school, said the old man unrelentingly. What do you want the child to be? I want her to be happy and free as a bird. But she is human, and it is high time for her to learn something. I've come now to tell you about it so that you can make your plans. She must come to school next winter. Remember that. I shan't do it, Pastor, was the reply. Do you think there is no way? The clergyman replied, a little hotly. You know the world, for you have traveled far. What little sense you show. You think I'm going to send this delicate child to school in every storm and weather? The old man said excitedly. It's a two hours walk, and I shall not let her go for the wind often howls so that it chokes me if I venture out. Did you know Adelheid, her mother? She was a sleepwalker and had fainting fits. Nobody shall compel me to let her go. I will gladly fight it in the court. You are perfectly right, said the clergyman kindly. You could not send her to school from here. Why don't you come down to live amongst us again? You are leading a strange life here. I wonder how you can keep the child warm in winter. She has young blood and a good cover. I know where to find good wood, and all winter I keep a fire going. I couldn't live in the village, for the people there and I despise each other. We had better keep apart. You're mistaken, I assure you. Make your peace with God, and then you'll see how happy you'll be. The clergyman had risen, and holding out his hand, he said cordially, I shall count on you next winter, neighbor. We shall receive you gladly, reconciled with God and man. But the uncle replied firmly, while he shook his visitor by the hand, Thank you for your kindness, but you will have to wait in vain. God be with you, said the parson and left him, sadly. The old man was out of humor that day, and when Heidi begged to go to the grandmother, he only growled, Not today. Next day, they had hardly finished their dinner. When another visitor arrived, it was Heidi's aunt, Data. She wore a hat with feathers and a dress with such a train that it swept up everything that lay on the cottage floor. While the uncle looked at her silently, Data began to praise him and the child's red cheeks. She told him that it had not been her intention to leave Heidi with him long, for she knew she must be in his way. She had tried to provide for the child elsewhere, and at last, she had found a splendid chance for her. Very rich relations of her lady, who owned the largest house in Frankfurt, had a lame daughter. This poor little girl was confined to her rolling chair and needed a companion at her lessons. Data had heard from her lady that a sweet, quaint child was wanted as playmate and schoolmate for the invalid. She had gone to the housekeeper and told her all about Heidi. The lady, delighted with the idea, had told her to fetch the child at once. She had come now, and it was a lucky chance for Heidi, for one never knew what might happen in such a case, and who could tell. Have you finished? The old man interrupted her at last. Why? One might think I was telling you the silliest things. 
There is not a man at Pratigan who would not thank God for such news. Bring them to somebody else, but not to me, said the uncle coldly. Data, flaming up, replied, Do you want to hear what I think? Don't I know how old she is? Eight years old and ignorant of everything? They've told me that you refuse to send her to church and to school. She's my only sister's child, and I shall not bear it, for I am responsible. You don't care for her. How else could you be so indifferent to such luck? You've better give way, or I shall get the people to back me. If I were you, I would not have it brought to court. Some things might be warmed up. That you would not care to hear about. Be quiet, the uncle thundered with flaming eyes. Take her and ruin her, but do not bring her before my sight again. I do not want to see your feathers in her hat and wicked words like yours. With long strides, he went out. You've made him angry, said Heidi with a furious look. He won't be cross long, but come now. Where are your things? asked Data. I won't come, Heidi replied. What? Data said passionately, but changing her tone, she continued in a more friendly manner. Come now. You don't understand me. I'm taking you to the most beautiful place you've ever seen. After packing up Heidi's clothes, she said again, Come, child, and take your hat. It's not very nice, but we can't help it. I shall not come, was the reply. Don't be stupid and obstinate like a goat. Listen to me. Grandfather is sending us away, and we must do what he commands, or he will get more angry still. You'll see how fine it is in Frankfurt. If you don't like it, you can come home again, and by that time Grandfather will have forgiven us. Can I come home again tonight? asked Heidi. Come now. I told you you could come back. If we get to Mayenfield today, we can take the train tomorrow. That'll make you fly home again in the shortest time. Holding the bundle, Data led the child down the mountain. On their way, they met Peter, who had not gone to school that day. The boy thought it was a more useful occupation to look for hazel rods than to learn to read, for he always needed the rods. He had had a most successful day, for he carried an enormous bundle on his shoulder. When he caught sight of Heidi and Data, he asked them where they were going. I'm going to Frankfurt with Aunt Data. Heidi replied, but first I must see Grandmother, for she's waiting. Oh no, it's too late. You can see her when you come back, but not now, said Data, pulling Heidi along with her, for she was afraid that the old woman might detain the child. Peter ran into the cottage and hit the table with his rods. The grandmother jumped up in her fright and asked him, what that meant. They've taken Heidi away, Peter said with a groan. Who has Peter? Where is she gone? The unhappy grandmother asked. Brigida had seen Data walking up the footpath a short while ago, and soon they guessed what had happened. With a trembling hand, the old woman opened a window and called out as loudly as she could, Data, Data, don't take the child away. Don't take her from us. When Heidi heard, she struggled to get free and said, I must go to grandmother. She's calling me. But Data would not let her go. She urged her on by saying that she might return soon again. She also suggested that Heidi might bring a lovely present to the grandmother when she came back. Heidi liked this prospect, 
and followed Data without more ado. After a while, she asked, What shall I bring to the grandmother? You might bring some soft white rolls, Heidi. I think the black bread is too hard for poor grandmother to eat. Yes, I know, Aunt. She always gives it to Peter. Heidi confirmed her. We must go quickly now. We might get to Frankfurt today, and then I can be back tomorrow with the rolls. Heidi was running now, and Data had to follow. She was glad enough to escape the questions that people might ask her in the village. People could see that Heidi was pulling her along, so she said, I can't stop. Don't you see how the child is hurrying? We have still far to go. Whenever she heard from all sides, Are you taking her with you? Is she running away from the uncle? What a wonder she's still alive. What red cheeks she has, and so on. Soon they had escaped and had left the village far behind them. From that time on, the uncle looked more angry than ever when he came to the village. Everybody was afraid of him, and the women would warn their children to keep out of his sight. He came down but seldom, and then only to sell his cheese and buy his provisions. Often people remarked how lucky it was that Heidi had left him. They had seen her scurrying away, so they thought that she had been glad to go. The old grandmother alone stuck to him faithfully. Whenever anybody came up to her, she would tell them what good care the old man had taken of Heidi. She also told them that he had mended her little house. These reports reached the village, of course, but people only half believed them, for the grandmother was infirm and old. She began her days with sighing again. All happiness has left us with the child. The days are so long and dreary, and I have no joy left. If only I could hear Heidi's voice before I die. The poor old woman would exclaim, day after day, a new chapter with new things. In a beautiful house in Frankfurt lived a sick child by the name of Clara Sessaman. She was sitting in a comfortable rolling chair, which could be pushed from room to room. Clara spent most of her time in the study, where long rows of bookcases lined the walls. This room was used as a living room, and here she was also given her lessons. Clara had a pale, thin face with soft blue eyes, which at that moment were watching the clock impatiently. At last, she said, Oh, Miss Roddenmeyer, isn't it time yet? The lady so addressed was the housekeeper, who had lived with Clara since Mrs. Sessaman's death. Miss Roddenmeyer wore a peculiar uniform with a long cape and a high cap on her head. Clara's father, who was away from home a great deal, left the entire management of the house to this lady on the condition that his daughter's wishes should always be considered. While Clara was waiting, Data had arrived at the front door with Heidi. She was asking the coachman who had brought her if she could go upstairs. That's not my business, grumbled the coachman. You must ring for the butler. Sebastian, the butler, a man with large brass buttons on his coat, soon stood before her. May I see Miss Roddenmeyer? Data asked. That's not my business, the butler announced. Ring for Tanette, the maid. With that, he disappeared. Data, ringing again, saw a girl 
with a brilliant white cap on her head, coming down the stairway. The maid stopped halfway down and asked scornfully, What do you want? Data repeated her wish again. Tinette told her to wait while she went upstairs, but it did not take long before the two were asked to come up. Following the maid, they found themselves in the study. Data held on to Heidi's hand and stayed near the door. Miss Roddenmeyer, slowly getting up, approached the newcomers. She did not seem pleased with Heidi, who wore her hat and shawl and was looking up at the lady's headdress with innocent wonder. What is your name? the lady asked. Heidi, was the child's clear answer. What? Is that a Christian name? What name did you receive in baptism? inquired the lady again. I don't remember that anymore, the child replied. What an answer! What does that mean? said the housekeeper, shaking her head. Is the child ignorant or pert, Miss Data? I shall speak for the child, if I may, madam, Data said, after giving Heidi a little blow for her unbecoming answer. The child has never seen such a fine house and does not know how to behave. I hope the lady will forgive her manners. She is called Adelheid after her mother, who was my sister. Oh, well, that's better. But Miss Data... The child seems peculiar for her age. I thought I told you that Miss Clara's companion would have to be 12 years old like her to be able to share her studies. How old is Adelheid? I'm sorry, but I'm afraid she is somewhat younger than I thought. I think she is about 10 years old. Grandfather said I was 8 years old, said Heidi now. Data gave her another blow. But as the child had no idea why, she did not get embarrassed. What? Only eight years old? Miss Roddenmeyer exclaimed indignantly. How can we get along? What have you learned? What books have you studied? None, said Heidi. But how did you learn to read? I can't read, and Peter can't do it either, Heidi retorted. For mercy's sake, you cannot read, cried the lady in her surprise. How is that possible? What else have you studied? Nothing, replied Heidi, truthfully. Miss Data, how could you bring this child, said the housekeeper, when she was more composed. Data, however, was not easily intimidated and said, I'm sorry, but I thought this child would suit you. She is small, but older children are often spoiled and not like her. I must go now, for my mistress is waiting. As soon as I can, I'll come to see how the child is getting along. With a bow, she was outside, and with a few quick steps, hurried downstairs. Miss Roddenmeyer followed her and tried to call her back, for she wanted to ask Data a number of questions. Heidi was still standing on the same spot. Clara had watched the scene and called to the child now to come to her. Heidi approached the rolling chair. Do you want to be called Heidi or Adelheid? asked Clara. My name is Heidi and nothing else, was the child's answer. I'll call you Heidi then, for I like it very much said Clara. I've never heard the name before. What curly hair you have. Was it always like that? I think so. Did you like to come to Frankfurt? asked Clara again. Oh no, but then I'm going home again tomorrow and shall bring grandmother some soft white rolls, Heidi explained. What a curious child you are, said Clara. You have come to Frankfurt to stay with me. Don't you know that? We shall have our lessons together, and I think it'll be great fun when you learn to read. Generally, the morning seems to have no end, 
for Mr. Candidate comes at ten and stays till two. That is a long time, and he has to yawn himself. He gets so tired. Miss Roddenmeyer and he both yawn together behind their books. But when I do it, Miss Roddenmeyer makes me take cod liver oil, and she says that I am ill. So I must swallow my yawns, for I hate the oil. What fun it'll be now when you learn to read. Heidi shook her head doubtfully at these prospects. Everybody must learn to read, Heidi. Mr. Candidate is very patient and will explain it all to you. You won't know what he means at first, for it is difficult to understand him. It won't take long to learn, though, and then you'll know what he means. When Miss Roddenmeyer found that she was unable to recall data, she came back to the children. She was in a very excited mood, for she felt responsible for Heidi's coming and did not know how to cancel this unfortunate step. She soon got up again to go to the dining room, criticizing the butler and giving orders to the maid. Sebastian, not daring to show his rage otherwise, noisily opened the folding doors. When he went up to Clara's chair, he saw Heidi watching him intently. At last she said, You look like Peter. Miss Roddenmeyer was horrified with this remark and sent them all into the dining room. After Clara was lifted onto her chair, the housekeeper sat down beside her. Heidi was motioned to sit opposite the lady. In that way, they were placed at the enormous table. When Heidi saw a roll on her plate, she turned to Sebastian and pointing at it, asked, Can I have this? Heidi had already great confidence in the butler, especially on account of the resemblance she had discovered. The butler nodded, and when he saw Heidi put the bread in her pocket, could hardly keep from laughing. He came to Heidi now, with a dish of small baked fishes. For a long time, the child did not move. Then, turning her eyes to the butler, she said, Must I eat that? Sebastian nodded, but another pause ensued. Why don't you give it to me? The child quietly asked, looking at her plate butler, hardly able to keep his countenance, was told to place the dish on the table and leave the room. When he was gone, Miss Roddenmeyer explained to Heidi, with many signs, how to help herself at table. She also told her never to speak to Sebastian unless it was important. After that, the child was told how to accost the servants and the governess. When the question came up of how to call Clara, the older girl said, Of course you shall call me Clara. A great many rules followed now about behavior at all times. About the shutting of doors, and about going to bed, and a hundred other things. Poor Heidi's eyes were closing, for she had risen at five that morning. And leaning against her chair, She fell asleep.
When Miss Roddenmeyer had finished instructions, she said, I hope you'll remember everything, Edelheid. Did you understand me? Heidi went to sleep a long time ago, said Clara, highly amused. It's atrocious what I have to bear with this child, exclaimed Miss Roddenmeyer, ringing the bell with all her might. When the two servants arrived, they were hardly able to rouse Heidi enough to show her to her bedroom.